starts right, right now. now. The August What's Neat the starts August, right now. The August What's Neat starts right now. Okay. So we got a point too. Ready, set. <laughs> Okay. Hi, I'm Holly Ann. And I am Scotty Hicks. And you are about to enter the wonderful world of model railroading with your host, Ken Patterson. Because the August, August was neat, neat starts, starts right, right now. now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. And by Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at bachmantrains.com. And thank you for helping us support the best hobby in the world. This is What's Neat for August 2022. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, the host of this, The What's Neat Show, over at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. And this month of August, we've got a really good show in that our first segment of video is Jennifer Kirk, all the way from the UK. She shares with us Trevor Jones' amazing garden railroad layout. And this is not in G-Scale. This layout is all HO scale, designed to be run outside. There's a lot of very interesting techniques that he has designed in order to make this happen, and it's sure to be a pleaser this month for the What's Neat video. Also this month, our drone pilot, Dan Scheidel, he shares with us some magnificent footage and modeling ideas from above, whereas we're flying over the burnt landscape of the Union Pacific Railroad in California where trestles have been burnt down and rebuilt, where the trees are blackened from the fire. And it's absolutely amazing. And it's actually made me think about how interesting it would to be modeling a segment of layout that would represent what it is we see in this drone footage. Because the way it's filmed from the air at just the right heights and the way we view our layouts, it's very easy to understand how to build our scenery to look just like that. Plus, there's some amazing nighttime drone footage. Now, when do you ever see folks flying a drone at night? With the mountains and the blueness of the sky, I've seen so many people put blue lights on their layout to represent darkness, and you can see that hue of blue in this nighttime footage as the ditch lights and the headlights on this Union Pacific Main Line light up all the territory in front of the locomotive. Also this month, we've got a great segment from Larry Harrington of Bachman Industries out in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He shares with us, again, some amazing new products from Bachman. It's always a pleasure to find out what's new first on the What's Neat show that we run every month. I'd also like to talk about the What's Neat This Week podcast. As you've heard me talk about it before, it's a show that we shoot every Saturday night down here to keep you updated on what's new in the hobby. We just recently passed a milestone of show number 200, whereas we reflect on all of the 132 guests that we've had in the past on the show and the more than 90 something manufacturers products that have been represented on the show. You can look this up on the whatsneat.com index, whereas you can guide through and look at all the personalities and their names and their photographs and all the subject matter that we have covered broken down per week, per month, all the way through. It's an absolutely amazing website to check out at whatsneat.com. It's an index for just that. And so with that, I'd like to say let's continue on with the rest of this August 2022 What's Neat. <laughs> So I've come here 
here today to what is actually a really different way of thinking about model railroading and it's to use the outdoors rather than uh, in a basement or an attic and I'm here with Trevor Jones who's very kindly invited us to see his garden railway and have you found any great difficulty in modelling in HO in the garden? No, the main thing is to have sound engineering principles for the construction of the track bed and I've used reinforced concrete with piles um, every three or four feet and then a topping uh, which I did developed using three grades of cork chips and some rubber chips, cement and SBR. That means that the track can just be pinned down with stainless steel pins. And of course being outdoors it's going to be a subject to a lot of the same things that a real railroad track would in terms of heat, cold, expansion, contraction. Have you had to make any special allowances for that? Well I don't have quite the extremes that you may have in America on mine but it has worked satisfactory and we have had temperatures up to the 100 mark what, since it's been laid and it has um, happily survive that. Uh, each yard of uh, track is soldered to a copper paxillin sleeper and I've left a one millimetre gap between the rail ends where the fish plates are. Some are insulated and some are the normal stainless steel fish plates and the, obviously they have to be linked across to conduct electricity uh, and that's served the test of time. And I think what uh, quite a lot of model railroaders think about when they think about building a layout outdoors is that it dominates the garden space. And one of the things that's really quite apparent here is that you've made the railroad very much a feature within a garden rather than being the main feature itself. And how important has this been and how practical has it been to do that in terms of choice of, of the vegetation and the plants? that you've got around it. Well you have to choose your plant material carefully and of course there's a terrific range of alpines that you can plant and dwarf trees which are bonsai like but there are specialist nurseries that provide them grafted onto rooting stock and if you plant them in small holes and, and crevices in rocks which you've used to build around the railway this will help restrict them as well. And how practical have you found it running HO scale trains in the garden uh, for the, the actual the locomotives, the freight cars, the passenger stock? Has, has it stood up quite well? Well I haven't had much problem with the stock. Obviously the track has to be kept very clean and uh, here in the UK where we have all weathers on one day, one looks for a forecast where you've got three dry days together, you spend one day cleaning and then you can sit out in the garden for two days and watch the trains go by in the landscape. And one of the things that uh, a model hobbyist might uh, find as a real advantage of modelling out in a yard or garden is that you've got a lot more space to play with. You don't have to negotiate with domestic authorities for uh, exclusive use of a room and that you can actually run prototypical length consists through the garden environment uh, and get a really effective prototypically correct look to things. Uh, is that Has that been a major consideration for you? Yeah I wanted to watch full length trains go by in the landscape so the actual layout is 2.79 scale miles round and of course it could be a lot longer if you've got the garden space for it and that gives you the opportunity to run full length trains and to watch them passing through the landscape. And of course one of the big advantages with making uh, very prudent choices of the plant life is that actually you can change the geographical location or even the continent very easily so you can run uh, US or Canadian or even Australian outline stock out here and it doesn't look out of place so it gives the model hobbyist a lot more variety in the stock that they could collect. Yes I do run American and continental stock from time to time uh, and for most of the layout the background would could be anywhere in the world obviously I've created these little cameo settings which include build, resin buildings um, which are typical British but 
you would just do the same if you were building in the USA, but with USA resin buildings. Absolutely, and uh, Backman uh, do produce a really good range of scenic accents, which would be perfectly acceptable to use uh, outdoors in the yard. Well, I'm even experimenting the uh, the sta small station areas outside. I do have covers on when the train's not operating, and I'm now exp experimenting with indoor, I'll call it scenic material, just to add into the corners of the layout. And have you had any difficulty with uh, little garden critters, maybe trying to make uh, their home in tunnels, or just uh, secreting themselves away in areas of the uh, the, the model? Well, there are several tunnels on this layout, and of course frogs do turn up in them. You would have to watch that you're not running into a snake in the USA. Make sure that the tunnel is not longer than double the length of your arm to your elbow so that you can clean inside. My construction has been a ferrous cement over the a tunnel uh, using polystyrene formwork on top of the track once the tracks have been laid. Then you put mesh over the top of that and plaster three to one rendering cement and sand onto it in two coats and it will stand you walking on it. You can then cover that area up with proper landscaping and plants even. And one of the standout features for me on this garden railroad are the bridges and trestles over the water features and it really strikes me that it gives a great opportunity more so than if you were working indoors to have these vast trestles that you can watch uh, trains go across and uh, what have you actually used to make the the bridges and trestles that we see here? Well bridges and uh, viaducts and trestles are a great feature for outside but obviously you've got to construct them in a way that they're weatherproof. Many of mine have used uh, ice section brass as the main part of the structure, infilled with um, sheets of aluminium and then supported by structures made from copper pipe and other brass structure to, to mimic to some extent a real bridge. Uh, you can then of course infill the top with the cork rubber to topping and then pin the track down as normal. Then some of the superstructure above has come from plastic kits. One of the things that model hobbyists might tell you that you can't have in the garden is turnouts because where are you going to put that switch machine to make it all work? But here is the perfect solution. We've got the switch machine hidden away underneath this lift out rocky outcrop and there's just a little plastic container that keeps everything water and critter tight and it all just works. And uh, if you had some advice maybe to yourself when you first started but certainly to any hobbyist who's looking to their yard and thinks this is a great space to be able to produce a huge layout uh, what advice would you give them? Well one of the important things is alignment with the sun. You do not want a rocky cutting which is in shade uh, and therefore takes a long while to dry out after a storm and that would be the main thing on the setting of, of how you lay out the layout. Also you will need to excavate because it's nice to be able to get down to its level so you'll see in mind that some areas of the garden have been excavated so that you're lower down and your eye are more in context with the uh, level of the railway. So thank you very much for inviting us down to take a look at your garden railroad that proves that even in the smaller scales such as HO it really is practical to be able to build a vast miniature landscape and actually make it not a dominating feature in the yard but to actually complement the other wildlife that's out there. And it's been brilliant to come out here. Thank you so much for inviting us down. It's been a pleasure, Jenny. Thank you.
For this segment of What's Neat, I've got Larry Harrington from beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, out at Bachman Industries. We all love it, Larry. When you're on the What's Neat show at Model Railroad Hobbies Magazine, because that's where we get to learn about all the new products, which a lot of people are going to be learning about now, this time, as this video comes out, because this video will come out as the Anamari National is now in its full schedule and launch. And I know that you guys are going to be debuting some amazing products. Tell us, what have you got to talk about today, Larry? Well, today I can't talk about the top secret stuff ready for NMRA, but I'll, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll share some uh, paint samples we got in over the last couple of weeks, and uh, it's a variety of um, scales and sizes here. So um, start off with, we have a, we're continuing to expand on our Ringling Brothers line. Um, we have the, this is the Pi car for the blue train. Nice. And... Um, I don't know exactly how many products we've done over the years, but it's, it's been a good number. And then we also did uh, the pie car for the red train. This, these, are an, these are an HO scale, by the way. And, um, we've, we do other scales as well, but the HO is primarily the, the... Now, this one I really love. This is the advertising car. It's got a lot of color to it. Uh, we did some neat effects with the screens over the, the uh, windows and... Um, it's you know, based on a prototypical car, so it's it's pretty neat. Um, so again, we got these three passenger cars to go along with our multiple um, items we have in in our Ringling Brothers line. We also have Ringing Ringling Brothers in large scale some some items, and also nice. in the, in Williams O scale. Um, I love it when you call it neat because that's the whole name of this show. What's neat? What's neat? And you're exactly. showing us what's neat. So, yeah, the, the Ringling Brothers is, you know, unfortunately the circus is no longer around, but we can still relive all those memories of, uh, we've had when we were kids and uh, uh, young adults or whatever and uh, going to the circus and seeing all the neat things. So, again, neat things, right? Um, so, um, going on to, we have some, a number of large-scale items in um, this uh, segment. So Oh, cool. Tell me we're going to talk about the Dash 9 somewhere in there. Well, we can talk about them a little bit. I don't have any of those to show with me, uh, but we are finalizing things and running into production now. So we should see those later this year. Nice. Uh, so nice. So those will be. But to go along with the dash dash nine, we made the um, fifty three foot Evans box car, and with we added to it this time was the end of train device. So we also sell this as a separate piece. This is a fully decorated sample that we have. Um, so I'm going to show you this. What we've done with this is we know that a lot of people not only run, you know, track power, they run DCC, but they also run battery um, control. So we made this unit so that it can be underneath there is a battery holder, holds a button battery. Okay. And then, and then on the back of the, the Fred, we have a little switch. So you can actually see it flashing. Oh, that'll look fantastic out in the dark. Yes, and what's neat about it is it will work on track power if you do have track power, and it, it will cons it will automatically switch as long as the switch is on where the light is active, the, the power will switch to take it from the track instead of from the battery just to conserve your battery power. So if you so if you are running on a regular analog battery power and you stop the train, your end of train device will stay on. Um, as long as you have a battery installed in the thing. So oh my that's, God, that's prototypical. Well thought out. Because it's not so. just, you know, folks run their Trains USA and they run their old Aristocraft and so many other different large-scale cars, and you can adapt this set of trucks to them. Right. This truck is, is sold as a single unit with the all the electronics already installed. Um, it has, we, it's a, since it's an end of train, it's a dummy coupler. It doesn't operate. It will couple up to another um, coupler, trains. Okay. but we what we did is we hid all the the wiring and electronics inside of the coupler so that you don't have any unsightly wires or anything um, when you train or anything to get snagged going out in the garden while you're running the train. So, that is awesome. Now that's cool. So switch is real easy. You just turn it off on the back, and there we go. We're set. So um, <laughs> now for the the fun segment of our uh, of our um, large scale, we have. Some very new 
egg liners that we just no oh, yes yeah so uh, this is we've we've had a Fourth of July Independence Day version before this is the latest one it has our founding fathers in the window it has a, a um, I don't know if that's showing up too well in the I do see the fireworks that's fireworks beautiful this, in yeah, gold exactly. in gold exactly that's so, pretty and these are self-propelled units they um, have interior lighting they also have a some people run um, large scale type of track or NMRA standard. So we have a polarity switch on there so that it goes in the proper direction when you're um, set it on the track. So these are, these are um, and they have co operating couplers on both sides. So you could put a small couple trains behind it or you could couple the, the uh, egg liners together and make a little mini consist like a and there unit is, train. And there is a prototype for that. They oh, there is. made yes. a yard tower for the railroad taking two tail ends off of two passenger cars and actually made a tower that way. Yep, it was New York Central. I believe we showed that in the previous segment. Right. So now this is um, a little bit of fun Halloween here. It has all your ghoulish characters in the windows this time. And <laughs> on the roof of this one, we have ghosts. And what's neat about this is they are glow in the dark. So you charge this up, you turn the lights out, and the, and the ghosts will glow in the dark as, that is as way it goes cool. around the track. Yes. So. What a great, great way to bring the youth into the hobby with some fun it's, and color. Exactly. Now, this one was com completely off the wall. Um, but <laughs> this is Egg Force One. Egg Force so, One. Egg Force One. So this is a, a parody of the Air Force One with... Um, and we have United States of Egg America <laughs> on the side. We have the... Of chickens flying the plane. We have the, the head guy in charge there um, and the two Secret Service hens in the back of roosters or whatever. Secret uh, Service hens. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, the new presidential egg seal and eggs we trust. So uh, trying to get a good... It's hard for me to see with this delay which way I'm trying to say this. eggs on we trust. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh my God, it's perfect. We got... Uh, okay. okay. Okay, you guys, talent. you guys have got some imagination going on out there now. We did. It was a lot of fun. It just kept growing. We we had like an <laughs> initial initial concept of this, and uh, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and more crazy. So I bet to, I bet you guys were all smiling during that board meeting. Yeah, it wasn't really a board meeting. It was kind of a you know a brainstorm between the offices or occasionally, and a couple phone calls. It's got the uh, even the tail number is prototypical for a, a Air Force One. So uh, there's there's actually two. Uh, it's 28,000 and 29,000. So I did a little research there um, when we did this so to make it look like the real thing. So these should be coming out shortly. So I can see the kit bashers putting wings on that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing we did a little bit differently with this, it won't show up in the, but the, the tail light is a little light red, just like the tail light on a, um, airplane wood so and so and finally some more fun this is not my area of expertise this normally um, Doug handles this this is our Thomas large-scale line we have a couple new box fans here okay so this is Beckham Bay shipping company and also we have um, mr. Jolly's chocolate factory so mr. Jolly's was a chocolate factory is in the stories it's uh every day one of the um engines goes to the factory where they pick up trucks for full of uh chocolate for i guess the town of sodor so sodor that's right yep. doug blaine is king of sodor he told me one he's, time on the phone <laughs> he is. it's king of sodor so i always defer all my questions to him so um hopefully that gives you a good idea we, we're going to have some really exciting announcements at nmra this year as we always do and can't wait to share them with everyone but um, that'll be the middle of august and we're we're getting ready for our print brochures as we speak so um finalizing all their selections for this year very cool how many folks are coming to the nmra show i believe five of us will be there this year very good i so look forward to hanging out with you guys you guys oh, are yeah. always so astute and the products cool. are i know this i know it's top secret we can't talk about it but maybe next month we'll have all that out there as well Oh, definitely. We'll have a you know live uh, announcement on our website and Facebook pages and all that good stuff. So, um, now I've anyway. said it before to you. You've got one of the best jobs in the world in that 
you ha are in a job that is your passion and you've been with Williams for countless years and then joined the Bachman team. And there's so many folks out there in their teens that are watching this show. They're aspiring to go to college and, and get a degree and maybe someday being able to be in our industry. Is that something that you could talk to in that? What would you say to those folks? How would they go about even getting into our industry like that? But it's, it's just about, you know, being ready when the opportunity strikes. So we did recently hire a young man, uh, Tyler. He's my assistant product development guy. He's, he's great. And he told me, he says, I can't believe I got my dream job. It's, um, you know, he's like, he, he's, he's applied for the job and uh, he really, really impressed me. And so we uh, are going to you know, eventually pass the baton to him. Um, so once, you know, oh, we're all getting up there in years. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, eventually retire, but it's going to be a few years off. So it's a, uh, but we got to prepare the company for continuation, right? So no, absolutely. And the Williams line is strong, isn't it? Well, we we start. I've been with Williams and Bachman. It'll be 25 years this October. Um, the combined two companies. So that's a big anniversary for me. I originally started in the um, associated with the train business with lifelike products in Baltimore before right. Walters purchased them. So that was my first job. Um, I had. Uh, some uh, I was working as a production planner for an associated line with the we had a line called I don't know if anyone knows about Darda race cars they were um, like match boxes that have wind up motors and they were stunt sets so I was, I was that's where I start but we all had product meetings that covered the entire line for trains um, you know we had also we had styrofoam coolers and stuff too at, at that location so um, we you know talked I got to be in on the conversations with the trains when, when it happened. And then, right. then I had the opportunity to come go to Williams afterwards. So, One thing yes. that I've noticed in this industry in the 33 years that I've been privy to work with the manufacturers and, and present my portfolios and get to know everybody, and I've seen already one and a half generations retire and then new folks come on, but one thing I've noticed is when you work for a company like Bachman or like Lifelike or like Athern and just go down the list of so many different companies that we are aware of, you don't actually leave the industry. A lot of people simply step stone from one company to another and their experience builds that way. Exactly. Yep. So it's always been a good industry in that we don't really lose people. They're always still the same faces at the trade shows but they're just that much more seasoned. Well, and actually, I would, have, you know, if if, uh, if Bachman hadn't purchased Williams, I'd still be at at the helm at the Williams these days. I'm sure. So uh, there we go. You know, so it was uh, an opportunity for both companies to grow. Um, they uh, at the time the only O scale items that Bachman had was uh, Plasticville and also our, our own 30 line. Yes. So the the three rail O gauge just fit in perfectly with Bachman and. I believe that was probably the best uh, for the legacy of the Williams line because if if it would have went to another three rail manufacturer, it just would have gotten absorbed into the name and no, you know, personal identity with the line anymore. That's absolutely so. awesome. And the opportunities don't just end with being able to go from a company to another one in our industry, but a lot of the folks learn the business so well as we've seen in the last seven or eight years. Various individuals from companies have actually started their own manufacturing business in our industry and true. really launched some neat new products. That's why the hobby is so diverse in so many different scales. And it's like, it used to be if you wanted something really great, something very detailed and specific, it would be in brass. And it's not like that anymore. Now you can get nope. whatever you want in plastic and the detail of plastic these days rivals what brass was in the 80s. Well, you can get whatever you want if there's enough demand for it. Uh, there's, still, there's still definitely room for brass in the market because of the startup tooling costs for the items are so much less expensive. It's uh, the unit cost is usually more expensive to produce. But when you consider the cost of making tooling for something, it has to be considered in the, the final price. And that's not always um, a good business decision to do that. So and the next revolution that I'm sure makes your job that much quicker and easier now is this 3D printing to create prototypes much quicker than cutting die work and then recutting the die work with changes. Would you agree? I, I do agree. We uh, used a good number of that for the development of our end scale charger. Um, yes. get, so we, we, pr we printed some 3D parts in order to 
test the fitting because it was such a you know much smaller um, locomotive to work with than the HO version. So we had to get make sure we could get the electronics and the speaker and everything in there, and um, you know work all all conjunction. So we're we're excited. We're well past that stage now. We're um, we've actually have you know test test painted samples. I I showed them in the last. The, what's this? It's probably be airing right around now. Those are beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah, so. I've got the HO scale chargers, the three yes. different various paint schemes here on the table. And on every podcast when we end the show, we always say, let's go run some trains. And more times out of not, the folks grab these off the shelf. This is a locomotive they want to see simply because the lighting effects are so amazing. It's just, it's just like the real thing. No, the lighting effects, the sound, everything is 100% authentic with those locomotives. Uh, there's... There's even a feature with the strobe lights. Um, we've had p customers call that didn't fully read the manual about the strobe lights. I can't get my strobe lights to come on. Well, in the real locomotive, the prototypically the strobe lights are only on when the headlights at full brightness and the ditch lights are on. So if one of those two is not on or fully full full brightness, the strobe lights don't come on, just like the real locomotive. So That's we amazing. program that into it. So. That's amazing. It's very important to read the instructions, and the instructions exactly. that you guys write are very thoroughly thought out. Well, thank you for that. So this is the best hobby in the world, and you know what? It's because of folks just like you, Larry. Is there anything else that you might want to say to close out this segment of the August What's Neat video? Well, just uh, if you haven't signed up for NMRA, and we're going to be out there in person, so. It's a good opportunity. We love going to shows. We've missed going to shows. Um, it's when we get, you know, the best feedback. Some, some feedback is a little uh, personalized for a certain person, you know, but most most of the times we get good ideas, uh, or we can explain, you know, why we're not doing something a certain way. And the people are very understanding of that when they hear it in person. So it's uh, um, the most, you know. You know, the most thing we get is like, well, why can't you do this prototype? And it's like I said, that's that's something might have been only made by one railroad and had, you know, maybe two two examples of and, and they and they no longer exist. So it's uh, more difficult to even find any information on them. But uh, that's something for the brass market. You know, we would we would steer away from something like that. So you're awesome, Larry. All right, folks, when you go to the NMRA National, be sure to hi, say hi to the folks at the Bachman booth and tell them that you saw Larry on What's Neat, right? I'll see you next week. I mean, see you next month when we're out there. So. All right, brother. Thank you so much for doing a great uh, segment on all the new products for this month. Uh, anytime. I'm glad to be here. Thanks again. Perfect. And that is Next time segment. I'll get a second pair of glasses so I can be just like you. <laughs> I know. George Boga talked to death to me once, too. And with that said, <laughs> that is this segment for What's Neat. All right. Take care. All the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at BachmanTrains.com. <laughs>